Well, this is going to be a continuing in my continuing video in my series on uh, ancient China. Um, not just an explanation of the history. In fact, it's not going to be an explanation of the history that would be, uh, in and of itself, enormous. It's just kind of um, my take on what what I've read and what insights that has into libertarianism. Before I get into the actual topic, I want to talk about a quick shout out. I want to give uh, going by the name of Duncan. Whitmore, that's D-U-N. Uh, he has uh, quite a few videos, and the couple that I watched were all exceptional. He, he writes this stuff down, and then he, he basically declaims it. And it's excellent. I watched this one on healthcare, social democracy, uh, a couple others, and they were all amazing. He's very, he's very uh, generous in his arguments. He doesn't make bad arguments. He goes through all of the most important, you know, uh, objections that people can raise. It's very articulate. Uh, so he reads very well. He writes very well. And he is criminally undersubscribed. He had nine subscribers when I started watching him. Um, most of his videos had less than 20 views. Uh, many of them had less than 10. Uh, so I am giving him a shout out and I will put out a link in the descriptions for people to check him out. I mean, the stuff he wrote on uh, healthcare was amazing. Um, you know, that's rare to get somebody from the UK, the land of the NHS, who can so, so effectively, you know, argue against uh, that fallacious system. So I'm putting that shout out there. And now on to review. So <clears throat> I finished the Qing and I wanted to read about the Ming and I decided to read a book that's not explicitly about the Ming but focuses mostly on their history and that is a book about the Great Wall of China aptly named the Great Wall of China from history to myth and this is by Arthur Waldron that's W-A-L-D-R-O-N. This book was published in the late 80s. Uh, this looks like it's coming from a library to my house to my library and uh, I knew enough about the Great Wall of China to know that it was pertinent when it comes to uh, the Ming. Uh, there's a lot of mythology around the wall. The kind of standard mythological um, narrative of the Great Wall of China is that the founding emperor of China, Emperor Qishuangdi, founder of the Qin Dynasty, um, back in the what is it, the second century BCE, um, built the Great Wall of China. And they continue to be built right up until modern times, and uh, you can go and visit it today. Uh, this is basically completely ri ridiculous. Um, the modern wall in China that people go visit, uh, the stone um, structures with crenellations, and uh, you know that kind of goes along the tops of mountains that you can visit. It's only a couple miles from Beijing is a structure that was built by the Ming Dynasty, not in 230 BCE, but in the last part, the mid and the late uh, 16th century, the 1550s, mostly on up until 1600s by the Ming Dynasty. Uh, previous dynasties and previous states in China did build walls. Um, they typically didn't, I don't think that they ever built them around their entire territory. Occasionally they would build them and they would sometimes build them. Uh, kind of the cliche is to build them between uh, settled agriculturalists and then nomads who uh, traditionally are not easy for the agriculturalist states to control. Um, however, these states, these walls were never a systematic system. They never were maintained beyond a few years. Up until the Ming, they were made out of earth primarily, uh, so they typically would not last for more than a few decades. Even in the early Ming, some of the first walls that they built were again made out of earth, and within 20 years they would be dilapidated to the point of uselessness. Uh, now, there's several very, there's several, there's lots of interesting things about the Great Wall. Why, why is it so uh, it's become kind of synonymous with China. How it's viewed in China and without of China has gone through a couple gradations of, of how people see it. 
the Chinese essentially came to view it as something of a failure uh, and an anachronism and something to kind of be embarrassed about. Europeans, um, not initially, but uh, in the more romantic periods, began to view it as uh, a very impressive structure and it became just something that um, Westerners were quite taken with and started as essentially inventing the mythology. You know, the thing that I was taught in school, literally taught, um, that you can see it from the moon, and some people have even claimed that you can see it from Mars. You know, how many bricks are in it, how many walls. Uh, McCartney, who was a British a diplomat who tried to have an audience with the emperor at the end of the 19th century, I'm sorry, the 18th century, um, you know, said that they had enough bricks to build every home in England and Scotland. Again, something that he would have no way of knowing. Um, you know, others said it could go around the world, and it became kind of synonymous in, with, with despotism, but also power, and um, it's now kind of essentially become a symbol in China. They're making, uh, putting a lot, they make great effort to kind of uh, prop it up. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, but from uh, an a libertarian standpoint, it's interesting in different ways. Uh, I think one, one way is that it reflects um, a, a very good illustration of Bastiat's dictum that if, when trade does not cross borders, armies will. Um, the perennial problem in China, especially in North China, has been the steppe pastoralists, the Mongols essentially, but not exclusively the Mongols, to their north and to their west. Um, up until relatively recently, states have been had have been had a very hard time establishing control over nomadic areas. They don't lend themselves over to being ruled by states. And what's more than this, logistically, until before the uh, Industrial Revolution, or perhaps just before, um, agricultural societies have not been able to develop the logistics or the technology to project power very effectively into the steppe. This sounds very strange today, but there is actually a problem raising enough horses and keeping them healthy enough to actually use mounted cavalry units in the extent that they would be required to project military power into the steppe, even though China would have easily a thousand times the population and wealth of the Mongolians. Um, now, the Mongolians, uh, you know, this is a classic case of, uh, oh, what is it? You know, they have they have their own, I, I, can't, I can't believe I'm forgetting the term, um, comparative advantage. The Mongols, where they don't have tons of surpluses, they don't have a huge population, they don't have as much a division of labor, they can raise things like horses and camels, other animals, leather, those kind of products, and a few other items that are more common there. So there's a very obvious incentive for there to be trade. And this trade, however, is usually found on by states. States don't like trade that they can't control. Um, they don't like having uh, essentially free people coming and mingling with people that they want to rule. Uh, and so they wish to mitigate, manage, and if they can't do that to prevent this kind of trade. So the history of China has had many different dynasties kind of approach how to have, have approached this, this um, dynamic many different ways. And the states that decided that they were going to not allow trade were the ones that had um, disastrous military engagements who uh, engaged in a lot of wall building such as the Ming. The states that had the least problems, the most peace, the least expenditures were the ones that opened up to trade. So in this we have the Yuan and the Qing. Uh, now the Yuan and the Qing are themselves actually foreign barbarians who took over China. The, the Yuan are themselves Mongols. The Qing are Manchus from Manchuria. Both of these uh, pastoralist societies took over the Chinese state uh, at different times, and both of them had, because of their origins, I think, or at least that would be the obvious reason, um, much more conciliatory views towards trade with other pastoralists. And they also realized that the way to keep the Mongols in line, to keep their brethren in line, is to trade with them. If you don't trade with them, then they're going to have to come and take what they need. They're going to have to raid. There's going to be violence. And so those two dynasties did well. 
The other one that did very well is the Tang Dynasty. That's going back to the 7 800s AD. I don't know all the details about the Tang, other than that their ruling dynasty was a very fusionistic one. It was a mixture of Chinese, Han Chinese, and Mongolian steppe people. They, didn't, they weren't called Mongolians back then. Uh, and I, one of their emperors is famous for saying he considered Mongolians and Han Chinese equals. He treated them equally. And so they had, by and large, very peaceful relations. And when they didn't have peaceful relations, it was able to at least negotiate. Um, if you look at the Ming, the Ming were Han Chinese. They were very strongly Confucian, and they took a very Confucian view towards the Mongolians, to the barbarians, uh, which was one that uh, they shouldn't intermingle, they should be kept at bay, they should be in a subservient position, and they're certainly not equal. And so the Ming, there's two ways you can go about it then. If you're not going to trade, you're going to have to fight. Um, and the early Ming tried to literally fight. They would send large armies into the steppe in attempts to, you know, at least frighten, if not completely destroy the Mongols. They really can't destroy um, people who are, you know, many times more mobile than they are, at least not effectively. There were massacres, but they couldn't systematically do it. Um, and the first few emperors of the Ming Dynasty managed to pull this off, but uh, they eventually had one big disaster, and from that point on, no one was willing to do it. Uh, and so the next policy then would be to try and keep the Mongols out, and that's where the Great Wall comes in. Now, I think the other interesting, so there's there's that kind of trade war lesson there that I think libertarians can uh, look at. Uh, the second one I, uh, is the politics involved in coming to the conclusion of building the walls. This stuff was actually hotly debated. You had all kinds of ministers and eunuchs and literati people throughout China, you know, citing Mencius, citing Confucius, citing Qi Di, citing the early Han emperor, citing the Tang. You know, these were very, very literate people uh, having very open discussions about, uh, primarily open discussions about how to deal with this problem. And there were quite a few of them who knew the correct answer, that there should be trade. This was not. This is not a libertarian looking back and saying they should have trade. Even though these weren't libertarians, there were Chinese people at the time, powerful ones, who were arguing just that. Now, why didn't that happen? This is what I think is instructive also to libertarians, because a best policy for the country took a second place to the internal power politics in the Ming court. So in the Ming court, you have an emperor, but the emperor can't run the entire government by himself, so there is a fairly vast and sophisticated bureaucracy. You have a number of ministers and generals, eunuchs and such. Eunuchs didn't have explicit political power, but they had a lot of influence within the palace, even though they weren't technically even supposed to be there by Ming times. And what happened is the, the emperors, if they weren't careful, would end up becoming figureheads. If they simply if one minister was giving all the best advice and they simply deferred to that minister all the time, then that minister would himself become essentially the ruler. Uh, he might, he may not actually depose the emperor, but he would be the one calling all the shots. Um, and this sort of happened. Uh, there wasn't a deposition, but one of the emperors was actually captured by the Mongols. This was the big battle that kind of changed everything. Um, the people at court basically selected his, uh, I think, his younger cousin to become the new emperor. And eventually the original emperor came back and they just kind of said, well, you're the, you know, you're the senior emperor, which meant you're in retirement, um, you know. And so what the emperors would then do is rather than take the best advice, they would always try and keep their counselors fighting against each other. They would always try and they would never always side with one person. They would always side with one and then another and then with another, even though that creates a completely... Um, you know, ridiculous policy initiative, you know, they're going to, okay, I'm going to do what you say, and I'm going to do what you say. Likewise, the various competing parties, instead of the arguments really being about the merits of this or that policy, it became, how do I take down my political rival? So the people who were advocating um, effective policies like trade were, were argued against, not by people who genuinely disagreed so much, although that did happen also, but by people who realized, if this person does this, and it proves to be effective, 
then they will have more prestige at court. They will be more powerful relative to me. They'll be able to appoint their friends to positions, and not I, the emperor, will trust them and not me. And so I'm going to argue against their position, regardless of how efficacious it may or may not be. Um, and this is what you had. And so what the author in this book says is wall building was nobody's first choice. Uh, the Confucian kind of orthodox view is that they are uh, just vermin that should be destroyed. That the right thing for the Confucians, a ruler to do, is to teach them a lesson, to march his army into the Ordos, um, the, the arid region in the north bend of the Yellow River, which is a very important strategic consideration in all of this, and just wipe out the Mongols and you know, set up bases there. Uh, now, their political opponents would rightly point out, well, you could do that, and if you win, it will be good. If you don't win, you'll lose an army. It'll be very expensive, and the next thing you know, we could have a new dynasty in here, which they were keenly aware of. They had just displaced a Mongol dynasty, and as it would turn out, they would get displaced by a Manchu dynasty in 150 years. <laughs> so, uh, but then likewise, when they would argue, what well, we should just do is have free trade, um, which I'm not necessarily free trade. We should allow managed trade. What their idea of trade would not make a libertarian super happy, but it would be better than rating. Um, but then the uh, political opponents would argue that's being you're not being very Confucian. You're that's morally wrong. You shouldn't take a conciliatory gr uh, road, uh, uh, attitude towards barbarians. You should be very uh, high and mighty in regards to barbarians. Uh, so the second best solution was wall building. If we can't beat them and we can't trade with them, then we have to cut ourselves off. It was nobody, nobody thought that this was an ideal solution. There, there wasn't anybody who argued that this was the most efficacious or the most good for the most people um, program, but it was the political middle ground that nobody could be wrong about. And so this is what they kind of settle on. So I think there is an illustrative point where it's not what's best for the most people. It's not efficient government. It's dominated by power politics. How do I stay in power? Uh, for the high ministers and for the emperor. The emperor realizes if he wasn't an idiot, and he could have been, uh, that even if one policy is best for China, if he selects that policy, the person who came up with the idea uh, would be in a very powerful position, and that that is something that he should warrant against now. The next part of this is the F, how, how walls do the walls work and why I think they impress foreigners so much. One thing about states that has to be admitted is that they are very good at taking a lot of resources and then expending those resources. I don't think there's any question about that. You, all you have to do is look at the pyramids and be like, yep, states are very good at, you know, uh, of the of the entire output of a society, skimming off a lot of it and concentrating at some place. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Unfortunately, that's not a sufficient condition for the most good for the most people or optimal in any kind of sense. Um, <laughs> not at all. Uh, I think what impressed Europeans so much is the scale, the logistical, how logistically impressive it was. The states in China had many more resources on net at their disposal than their European counterparts up until the Industrial Revolution. And I think that I think that a lot of Europeans when they looked at it and if they had nationalistic kind of ideas or or really appreciated state power, they would look at things like the Great Wall or the Grand Canal or the Forbidden City and be like, Wow, that this state is awesome because it has and just like they would if they were to look at the pyramids. It's impressive in that regard. Uh, but it's not impressive in how effective it was. Uh, the cost of the wall itself was enormous. There's an entire literature dedicated to people suffering to try and maintain the walls, the lives of the people uh, manning the fortifications were quite abysmal. Um, you know, if you think, if, if there just hadn't been a wall, you know, a peasant in, in, in the border provinces, you know, the most likely interaction with a Mongol would be a Mongol rides up and says, hey, I have some horses, would you like one of my horses and we can maybe do a trade um, for some of your rice or some of your millets or whatever, maybe some of your silk. Uh, that would be a better interaction than um, giving up 
half of your labor during the summer and then half of your yields for the rest of your life and your children's life to build and then provision a wall and then never have any horses. <laughs> but that's what was asked of millions and millions of people. Um, the second thing is, is it didn't actually work. Um, it's impossible to concentrate enough forces in the defense to prevent uh, penetration. There was a ma and and wa one thing to be noted is the wall was never a continuous rampart. Uh, there was no point where you could not have crossed it just by walking. Now there were very long sections, hundreds of miles. Um, they tended not to fortify places that should have been relatively inaccessible, high mountains, that sort of thing. Um, but you know, nomadic raids, nomadic uh, intrusion, incursion. Uh, still happened and since official trade was not allowed uh, these were violent. Now the Mongols for them, their part and let's not pretend that they were perfect uh, whenever they would raid they would continually say we don't want to raid we want to trade if you let us trade you know this is not going to happen we can put a stop to this and during Ming times they didn't do this now during Qing times they did during Yuan times, obviously, did they did. During Tang times, they did. When in, in those periods, they were able to have relative peace, especially compared to these. Um, so there is a big raid in 1550 uh, under the Altan Khan, uh, where they, I mean, they had no trouble getting around the wall and essentially attacking Beijing. They couldn't get into the city proper, the main part of the city. It was it had fortifications around the city, but they burned most of, most of the city. And another interesting thing is the military ineffectiveness of the Chinese military relative to the Mongols was such that they didn't even try and fight. I mean, um, there are actually people inside the, the city asking, you know, the head of the Ministry of Defense, you know, why don't you stop them? And he goes, because we'd get wiped out, so, you know, we're not even going to try. And then you have to ask yourself, what's the point of having these people? <laughs> why does he get a salary, you know, and like 20% of the grain yields forever if when it comes down to it, he's not even going to deploy. Now, the more famous um, fall of the wall came in 1644 when uh, the Manchus were able to uh, penetrate and take over the state and form the Qing Dynasty. Now, I alluded to this in one of my previous videos and a commenter pointed out uh, that this isn't a good example because they were let through the wall. The wall didn't work because a renegade Ming general, I forget his name, I think it was Wu something, um, opened the gates and allowed them through, and, you know, if that had not happened, uh, you know, the wall would have worked. So the wall was a good idea, it just it didn't work because of that little uh, technical detail. Um, and I've I've read different things, I've heard some, some writers say that uh, the Manchus couldn't have gotten through without his help, and others who said it didn't matter. But I think that, that he's, he's absolutely correct that a, a renegade general allowed this to happen, but I think that proves the point more. We have a situation then where literally the sweat, blood, sweat, and tears and the lives of, not the life, you know, blood, sweat, and tears of millions of Chinese laborers and taxpayers um, and, you know, probably thousands of lives um, were undone by the decisions of a single bureaucrat. You know, literally one guy with the keys to the kingdom um, and he could have done it on purpose, or he could have done it on accident, but the result's the same. So, yes, the Ming states commanded enormous resources and built, you know, these impressive walls, although they're not visible from the moon, unless you have a very high-powered telescope or whatever. So I bet they are visible from Mars if you have the Hubble, but whatever. Um, <laughs> um, but all that resource aggregation then came to naught. It's even true with the pyramids; they got robbed. Those, the, you know, those pharaohs went to all that trouble, and I, those were grave robbed in antiquity. We don't even know how far back. It was probably three thousand years ago, or longer. Uh, you know, uh, so you know, if 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 all that core V labor, you know, pulling up the blocks to however they did it, they still don't know how they did it in the pyramids for twenty-five years or whatever it was. Uh, so that the king could rest at peace, and he doesn't even rest at peace. And why is his resting at peace even worth all that? Another question, you know. And then we have the Great Wall doesn't stop any of the big ratings. The cost benefit analysis completely fails, and then it completely goes out the window. And you know, I don't even think this is like some rare example. I look at our country today, 
And the most obvious example would be like 9/11. No one, one. I was, I had the whole conspiracy theory stage in my life, and, you know, maybe whatever. But I think that the official story is itself more condemning than any any conspiracy theory because what it's basically saying is that our defense budget, our military shield, shield, um which costs well over a trillion dollars. The military that existed in 2001, you know, if you look at how much its aggregate expenditures since, you know, the military industrial complex was born in 1940, uh, is many trillions of dollars. Uh, with a huge bureaucracy of millions of people who that's their sole function is to think and act out militarily. And ignoring for the fact right now that the military itself and government policy generally is what's provoking the attack in the first place. On the day then it's actually needed, 19 guys with box cutters get around it and do, relatively speaking, an enormous amount of damage. Like, I mean, they attack the headquarters. You know, like, like the Germans were never able to attack the Pentagon, you know, or the Japanese. Uh, they never were able to bomb anything in New York City, let alone the two tallest buildings. I mean, it's 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 very similar to like the Great Wall, where you have all these resources and then just oh, it's butterfingers, and all of a sudden you get a new Mongol invasion or Manchu invasion or both actually, at different times. And so, yes, states can uh, use taxes and take all these resources and and then pile them up in places, uh, but that doesn't prove that it's effective. And there's reasons why, and I think the two main reasons are the knowledge problem and the incentive problem. Um, once they have all those resources, are, it's much easier for them to think what's best for me than it is for them to think what's the best for everybody. If that, if that is not a knowable thing anyway, but if it, even if it was, it's easier for an emperor to look at it and be like, what's best for me? Or a president to be like, what was going to get me elected next time or make me popular or seem powerful? Much easier than it is to, what is the optimal way we could expend these funds for America? I, I would be surprised if that conversation even once happened. Even, even once. Now, when they're justifying something after they've made a decision, they're going to say, they're going to justify it in those terms. But when they're actually you know, they've got the resources, what are we going to do with it? The idea that uh, they, 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 exp they think primarily in those terms, I think, is, is very difficult. But the other problem is, even if they do, how are they going to know what's the best way? So, you know, how, how do these Ming emperors who grow up in court, you know, being trained by eunuchs, you know, who don't know anything about the steppe or Mongolians, uh, which, by the way, the earlier emperors did know a little bit more, which is why they had more success, or why the Yuan had more success, because they were Mongols. Um, how are they going to know what to do with the agricultural output of all of China, you know? How are they going to know what the best way? They're not. I mean, and how are they going to know it today? They're not. So even if they even if they wanted to, you know, the idea that they were going to... And, and we can see this today, like, it, it, look at the roads. I defy anybody to look at the pattern of road construction and maintenance in the United States and then look me straight in the face and tell me that is fucking optimal. Like, and I don't mean perfect, that's impossible, but like, is there any attempt to, to figure out what's best? Because, you know, where I live, they just do a grid pattern over the entire area, even though, like, geographically and population wise, that makes no sense. There's no reason to have one mile by one mile square roads, you know when you've got a river that goes like this and a lake here and all the people live in one spot and like it's just it makes sense from a political like bureaucratic like standpoint and no other and that and like sometimes it's not as blatantly wrong like think okay the road between boston and new york should probably have a lot of lanes because there's a lot of people well whoop de doo congratulations but they don't really get the, the timing really good because when there is high volume there's usually way too much traffic and then you go out other places and you got miles of road with nobody that's a less than optimal use of resources either way you slice it and that's the entire road system we could say the same about the school system about the mil the military jesus christ i mean 
yeah, we really need them bases in Iceland because if we didn't, you know, Russians would invade, and, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> and I just, I just was reading, uh, I won't put the link up, uh, but somebody posted how they, how some of the bases are faking the return of, of uh, veteran remains. You know, they have this deal where they're supposed to go out and they're supposed to find people who died in like Vietnam or World War II and their their bones are still out there and they're, they're supposed to bring them back and they have these very somber ceremonies where like a C-130 and they pull them out and they're casket covered and uh, with the Marines and like all the old veterans come out and watch and wave their little flags in their wheelchairs you know and then it turns out at least the one at the one in Hawaii it's fake. Like the C-130 doesn't even fly. It gets towed out there. The caskets are empty. Like the guys who go on missions to try and find these bones are mostly going to like Hawaii or, you know, the Philippines to go on vacation. And, you know, they just don't, logistically, it's not worth their time, but they want people to get the impression. But here's what makes sense. They want people to get the impression that they really somberly care about soldiers, which <clears throat> if you're in the military or you were in the military, you probably would roll your eyes at that idea because they don't give a fuck especially about you once you're dead or once you're out of the service I was just talking to one and he was telling me we were talking about the the site and this guy's not a libertarian he's a friend of mine I made in other areas and uh, he was talking about the thousand eye stare guys the guys who have just you know are homicidal maniacs and have done the most terrible things imaginable and this is not a libertarian this is not somebody who's like war is wrong and blah 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 and and he's like yeah well they just let him go and they figure they'll kill themselves later and they don't care <laughs> like, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know but they want people to think that they care and so it makes sense to put on the little show and that's it i mean they're not actually doing you know and and i talked about the this in the previous video, you know, they're building, they subsidize all these temples because ideology is important. Like they, they care that people perceive them as legitimate, so they go to some effort in that regard. But that's not, that is not a cost benefit analysis of what's best for the society. That's a cost benefit analysis of what's best for us to stay in power. And that's what they're doing, you know, and, and like, since that's the case, I kind of think it kind of makes them not very justified, I guess is my, is my point. So, um, Good introduction of this book. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it unless you're really interested in China, but he does do a good overview of the dynasties. He talks uh, this, about the stuff in the Warring States period. Um, you know, you will have a kind of a basic idea, and you'll learn a lot about uh, an iconic world structure that is um, horribly misunderstood uh, in popular culture. So you can always sound like the smart ass at the party who's like, actually, you can't see it from the moon. And it was built during the Ming Dynasty. And the person who was just looking impressive by citing totally erroneous facts is going to be like, what is the Ming? And then you're going to be like, you're an idiot. Well, no. That's how it's implicit that you're saying that whenever you correct somebody. But you wouldn't explicitly be doing that, hopefully. But anyway, I think that's it. Uh, check out Duncan Whitmore's channel. It's well worth your time. Uh, I'm going to keep watching his videos going back because uh, each, one, each one I've seen has been very good, very, very good indeed. Uh, so, all right, I'll talk to you all later.